January 4th, the opening day of the 2023 legislative session. The Connecticut General Assembly is poised to make decisions this year that will affect the future of our state. And to hear the Connecticut news junkie put it, the Connecticut budget is overflowing with black ink. Thanks to extra pension payments, an influx of new residents over the past two years, and smart budgeting, our state has capped its rainy day fund and a surplus for the first time in years. If you were to ask municipal leaders how they would spend it, they would start with fully funding programs like ECS and Pilot, helping towns and cities ease the burden of the regressive property tax. We're going to hear from local officials from CCM's board of directors, education officials, and the thoughts of some of our legislators today on our special edition of the Municipal Voice live from the state capitol. The Municipal Voice is a Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or member municipal leaders. Welcome to the Municipal Voice, coming to you live from the Connecticut State Capitol building. Joining us today, we have Representative Jeff Curry, the House Education Chair, Lisa Hammersley from the Connecticut School Finance Project, and our own Brian O'Connor from Public Policy and Advocacy. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, Representative Curry, let's start with you. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, you were recently named the chair of the Education Committee. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, so, what are going to be your top priorities? Uh, first and foremost, we're going to continue working on accelerating the ECS formula to mm -hmm. provide a student-centered funding model for all public schools throughout the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, so. ECS and accelerating formula, what would it take to actually accomplish that? Um, a whole lot of support from a whole lot of important people. Uh, <laughs> first and foremost, uh, we are going to continue to work in a bipartisan fashion through the Education Committee and Appropriations, uh, of which chairs have um, given their support over the last couple of years mm -hmm. on this initiative. Um, both Senate and House leadership have uh, stated that they are going to prioritize this uh, accelerated funding, mm -hmm. and then it's a matter of getting the administration and the governor to understand the importance of why uh, we need to provide uh, additional resources to many of our under-resourced students, uh, where 67% of our students are uh, attending schools that are severely under-resourced at the moment. Excellent. Uh, Lisa, and uh, where do you come in on UCS? So we are a non-partisan um, policy organization, mm -hmm. um, and we've developed and worked with Representative Curry on this initiative to um, provide resources to students um, when the federal fiscal cliff occurs in mm -hmm. fiscal year 2025. And I think that a 10-year phase in, it's, it's important or it was comfortable for the state legislature um, being phased in over a 10-year period because that means more meaningful or smaller increases year over year. But from a student's perspective, we are essentially losing an entire body of students. So it's important to accelerate the funding, to have the funding provided when the resources expire so that mm -hmm. teachers and other um, support that was provided as a result of the federal aid can continue upon its expiration. Great. Brian, what are, you, what are you hearing from the town leadership? I was going to say one of the things that is of concern for some of our, what they consider overfunded towns is how does the acceleration of ECS impact them? Absolutely. So the bill that we've worked on for the past few years does not impact them. In fact, it, there is a positive benefit to those towns. So currently, next year, the towns will, that are considered overfunded, according to the formula, will continue to be phased out. Mm -hmm. um, the bill does not impact that phase out. However, there is a financial benefit to 75 of the 88 losing towns that are mm -hmm. currently overfunded because towns will no longer be required to pay for regular education tuition for those students that decide to exercise choice. So every currently, every time a student decides to exercise choice, that's, that town is then on the hook for a mm -hmm. tuition bill that they have absolutely no control over. So this will eliminate that bill and will financially um, result in a net positive for 75 of the eight towns, as I mentioned. And speaking as mm -hmm. uh, former Board of Ed Chair in East Hartford, that tuition bill jumped from, I think, about $750,000 to well over three or $4 million in a mm -hmm. short period of time. So those are resources that could be put directly back into the uh, classrooms within those towns and communities. Great. It is important to note that with the bill, and it, because the regular tuition billing is eliminated, mm -hmm. it will stop the friction that tends to occur within the public school system where districts, you know, do not encourage necessarily their students to exercise choice mm -hmm. and to attend a magnet school, for example, outside of the region because there is that fiscal impact. So by eliminating regular education, um, it will result in like a, a more friendly um, mm -hmm. school choice climate in the state of Connecticut. 
um, and it, it will result in a net financial benefit. To so it's currently, in a lot of ways, it puts them in competition with each other? Abs well, I don't know if competition is, is the correct term, but you know, if one or two students decide to exercise choice and attend mm -hmm. a rest magnet school, for example, um, that district where the student is leaving, they didn't have no savings as a result of those yeah. two or three students leaving their district. Mm -hmm. And so currently, they have to pay. They have to still continue to employ all of the teachers and all the other mm -hmm. supports in the school, but then they have to pay. They have to pay. So by eliminating the tuition billing, mm -hmm. um, you know, there will not be that adversarial type relationship between different types of public schools in the city. Interesting. If, if I may, I, mm -hmm. I have a question for uh, Representative Kerry and Lisa um, regarding, have you been, I know you have sort of a road show. You've done that with us. Have there been other stakeholders that you've engaged in that are supportive of the concept of accelerating the ECS and others? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've built probably one of the broadest coalitions of any initiative um, under the dome currently. Um, and it's well outside only educational institutions. We're looking at uh, business leaders in all various sectors, uh, real estate um, associations, um, having everybody understand that we talk about having the skilled educated workforce in these pipelines into these jobs that are available throughout the state. And you're not going to have that workforce unless they're skilled and educated. And so we have to put the focus back on K-12 education to ensure that we're providing that high quality learning experience for every child every day to ensure that we're, we're uh, providing that next generation of workers. Um, I think, you know, we all know central to the education experience is, of course, teachers. And we are looking at a teacher shortage in many places. Um, a lot of places, teachers are left to buy resources for their own classrooms. Um, the career doesn't necessarily look promising to a lot of uh, young people today. How can we incentivize college students into the classrooms? I think we have to start a whole lot earlier and really focus back on the high school to get those students interested. And I think right now what they're seeing is they're seeing teachers and educators and support staff who are stressed to the max because of everything that they're being tasked to do. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that there are the shortages and that they have classrooms of 28, 29 students with no additional help. Yeah. Um, and so we, we have to first be able to provide the support for those classroom teachers so that those students then see that this is something that they might want to go into at the same same time understanding that we have a an enormous gap when it comes to the wage um, of what we pay our teachers throughout the state of Connecticut mm -hmm. and there's no reason why a student should leave on a Friday night from school or Friday afternoon and then at night see their teacher tending bar just to be able to make ends meet yeah. uh, so we have to be able to provide those additional wages for teachers as well as the protections because right now teachers frankly are under attack throughout the entire country when it mm -hmm. comes to a number of matters and so I know we're going to be working very closely with the teachers unions on seeing what we can do to be able to provide those protections and then as I said hopefully that trickles down to those high school students who will be a little bit more interested in the uh, in, in the teaching profession. Great. Lisa, do you have anything on this issue? No, oh, I think Representative Curry summed it up perfectly. Great. Um, CCM also initiative of teachers has been looking at the lack of paraprofessionals. Uh, does the state have any plans to foster candidates into these roles as more and more skilled professionals retire? I think we are looking at all avenues of how to staff up all of our support staff. Um, we know that the paras are uh, oftentimes the backbone of those classrooms, and I think they are definitely um, underappreciated for the level of work that they do. And so if we can provide ways in which we can attract different folks back into the classroom where they know that they're, they're going to be supported, they're going to be safe, and they're going to be effective, then hopefully we can take care of that shortage. Great. I would add, um, adding to the importance of passing this bill, this legislative session, we mm -hmm. know that districts have used $430 million of the $1.6 billion of one-time federal dollars mm -hmm. to support personnel. Um, yep. Many of those positions are for teachers, so while there is a teacher shortage, there has been an increase in the number of teachers employed across the state mm -hmm. of Connecticut. Unfortunately, the teacher shortage is occurring in the most under-resourced communities where they okay. pay the least amount of wages. Um, but there have been hundreds of paraprofessionals hired. So mm -hmm. getting back to the importance of the bill, you know, if this bill is not passed, it will result in those types of positions needing to be eliminated for districts that cannot afford mm -hmm. to continue that expense ongoing. So through some of the federal funds, we've made progress on some of this, but we need this bill to continue it beyond that. Absolutely. Brian, where, where are we on this yeah. issue? Well, we're very supportive. I think that's one of our concerns mm -hmm. is to make sure that there's adequate staffing. Um, as Representative Curry mentioned, it's very important for, you know, to start early, make sure that they get the education that they need because we need a skilled workforce uh, in Connecticut. You know, we have a lot of high-tech jobs and we need to be able to fill those. 
uh, not only now, but into the future. And I think one of the things that has come up with uh, CCM and our membership in one of the biggest cost drivers of our local budgets is special education. What are your plans to tackle that, Representative? Yeah, so first and foremost, I, I think we have to make sure that we talk about when uh, the ECS funding bill that we're, we're uh, advocating for it does not impact special education. Special mm -hmm. education is a beast uh, all on its own. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't bifurcate that funding here in the state of Connecticut. It's all kind of one tranche of money uh, that goes to the districts to be able to pay for special education. Um, we have, over the last couple of years, tried to take a look at the cost of services when it comes to a lot of the house placements. Um, excess cost was something that was addressed or attempted to be addressed in the last legislative session, um, which is just a small portion of the overall special education costs that we're seeing. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we worked on this formula that has included various weights for um, concentrated poverty, for EL students, and it might be worth having a conversation once we pass this to then see maybe we want to include an additional weight uh, for special education students that would put money directly into those districts for uh, those specific services. Great. Um, and one other thing that uh, TCM we've identified as an issue regarding education is uh, school security. Uh, the top of school security remains a focus for school and municipal leaders around the state. Um, while there has been some assistance to support updates of school security, these grants are no longer being fully funded. Um, how would you deal with issues around school security? I think this is oftentimes a district by district um, matter, and, and many districts will want to go all the way to, to, to full extreme of what they can do. Other districts feel secure as where they're at. Um, you know, we have the conversation around school resource officers when it comes to overall security, um, and this is also something that varies district to district, um, but I think it, it deserves an overall conversation to see if there's anything that we can do at a state level as opposed to leaving that up to a little bit more local control. Great. Uh, Brian, is there anything at CCM that we've recommended on this topic? I, I think one of the biggest thing is, is being able to pay for uh, some of the school security upgrades you know, through bonding and, and other measures. I think those are some of the things that we've been advocating for over the years. Great. Uh, Lisa, is there anything else you'd like to talk about while you have the microphone here about education in Connecticut? Well, generally, um, Connecticut having a system that is so reliant on property taxes, it results in a system where those communities that have the fewest amount of resources are also those communities that are trying to educate the kids with the highest level of need. Um, Connecticut's education finance system is disjointed. It has various grants provided to other types of public schools that do not recognize the need of the student. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that passing House Bill 5003 um, and possibly seeing what's in Senate Bill 1 um, mm -hmm. will be a tremendous step forward for the students in the state of Connecticut so that the legislature can then um, prioritize other education finance issues such as special education. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brian, while we have Representative Curry and, and Lisa here, do you have any other questions or concerns that you would like to bring light? The only other thing that we would bring up is uh, early intervention in education. I think that's one of the key things that we've seen evidence that, you know, the earlier the child can read and do math, the more successful they are. Especially, I think there, there's a, a major tipping point. If, they, if they're not at reading levels by third grade, that there's higher levels of incarceration, um, dropouts later on in high school. Is, is, do you see the legislature working on anything in, in those regards? Yeah, uh, this last legislative session, uh, we passed the, uh, our, the big reading bill that created the office with an SDE. Um, that, that has had a bit of controversy when it comes to how that's being ruled out within the individual districts. So uh, we may kind of have another conversation about that. Uh, to see how we best implement that. But you're absolutely correct. If the kids aren't uh, learning to read by day three, they're no longer reading to learn thereafter. And so, um, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure everybody understands the importance of that um, at all levels of government here in this building, uh, but we're going to make it our mission to put education at the forefront of everything that we do uh, this legislative session. This does too, uh, Brian, get back to the funding issue as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you have a, a municipality such as Bridgeport that doesn't have a lot of local property um, wealth to fund education, um, you have a classroom where there are 29 first, second, and third graders in a classroom mm -hmm. with no additional paraprofessional support and one teacher. And those students um, very likely have additional learning needs. It should be of no surprise to anybody that there are students that are not learning to read in such an environment. And so 
Um, moving the funding bill like this forward could certainly help to reduce class sizes to increase teacher pay. Because certainly if I'm in Bridgeport and you look at the salary scale for a teacher in Bridgeport, mm -hmm. um, it's much lower than its surrounding towns. And so if I'm a teacher, why would I stay in a classroom with 29 kids and no additional adult support? You know, the system is failing and it needs to be corrected. Thank which, you. which, which I, I think it's very important that you know we often hear it, 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 it shouted that we have the second and third best education system in the country. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cute, and you can say that, but yeah. when you walk into that classroom in Bridgeport that Lisa just discussed, you know that's not the case. Yeah. So uh, I think it's very important people don't sleep on the fact that we still have a ton of work to do to ensure that those kids in Bridgeport and all of the under-resources districts are getting everything that they deserve. Can I piggyback off of uh -huh, that? You certainly can. Getting back to the third um, best state in the country for education, we have one of the most underperforming districts in the country, in mm -hmm. our state. You know, we are a very wealthy state, and the city of New Britain, unfortunately, is one of the most lower performing districts across the country, which is mind blowing yeah. to me. Um, they're four and a half grades behind the national average in test mm -hmm. scores, and that is unacceptable. And one of the most underfunded districts is, in fact, New Britain. So yeah. with the passage of this bill, um, they will get the infusion of cash that they have been, you know, not receiving yeah. throughout history to be able to start to make improvements, which will then, of course, result in a, a better workforce, you know, more prepared yeah. students to go into the workforce. I had a conversation with somebody from Stanley Black and Decker, mm -hmm. and he said, we don't need kids that have, you know, um, skills. Mm -hmm. We need kids that can graduate from high school and have yeah. the confidence to be able to come here and learn. Yeah. You know, and having an appropriately funded education system will result in that. Great. Well, Representative Curry and Lisa Hammerfleet from the Connecticut School of Finance Project, thanks for joining us today. Uh, everyone at home, you're listening to Municipal Voice coming to you live from the Capitol. Stick around. We'll be back in a few minutes with more interviews. Thanks. And when you're back with the Municipal Voice, coming to you on WNHH, 103.5 FM, we are here at the Capitol live. Uh, joining us now, we have Mayor Tom Dunn and Mayor Laura Hoydick. Thank you both for joining us today. We got a lot to talk about today, but first off, uh, you were both recently elected uh, by a group of your peers to uh, be the Vice President and President, respectively, of the Board of CCM for next year. Um, you could just say a little bit briefly about what you're looking forward to as, in that position. Yeah, well, for me, it's uh, it's a great honor to represent 168 um, towns and cities that are members, but also representing the other town that's not a member. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been doing that for years up here, and it's just looking forward to working as a team to keep what we have and actually improve on what we have. Uh, we're working together with with Laura. It's going to be great. Uh, we got a good rapport, and uh, I think working with everybody else, and it's just an honor to be chosen. Great. Laura, how do you feel about being vice president for this year? Well, it is an honor, and I agree with Tom. Uh, it's great that CCM has worked so hard with um, the legislature and the administration in mm -hmm. the state of Connecticut to improve the residents' lives and how our municipalities are able to operate. Great. Um, so we noted earlier in the show when we were talking about education, um, the state has a healthy budget for the first time in years with uh, so many grants underfunded. Do you think it's time that the state begins to fully fund programs like pilot or ECS? Uh, let's start with you, Tom. Yes, absolutely. I think um, the ECS is important, but uh, more so, and we'll talk about it, and Laura will touch on that a little bit later, is the special education. I mean, education mm. is number one. All these other, everything else is so important, but education, I think the state agrees on that, so we just want to keep people we have and try to actually improve, improve on, uh, yeah. on the ECS, and special education has to be talked about. Great. Laura? So accelerating ECS is very important to those communities that receive ECS funding, mm -hmm. and so we're all in favor of that. Uh, but special ed affects every single community, and if the state were to take more responsibility for the funding of it, I think that would help everyone and in, in concert have a consistent program across the state as well as being able to lower property taxes. Yeah. Brian, I know we talked about this a little bit before, but what kind of challenges does the funding of special education pose to our towns and cities? I, I think what it comes down to is that special education, what it does is it starts to crowd out spending for other um, important things within the uh, school community and the school district. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. Definitely. So I echo what Tom said about uh, dispatch. Mm -hmm. If 
if communities want to work together, they should be able to work together, just mm-hmm. like with shared services. Enforcing uh, or making communities have to do something is, is not really the way to go, yeah. especially if they already have a viable system. In Stratford, we're lucky. We have an outstanding dispatch. We have a paid and volunteer EMS and ambulatory mm-hmm. service, but we also have mutual aid where we have ambulances that come in and are paid fire and police always have mutual aid to go to reach out to. Not every community is like that. So mm-hmm. I think it's based on what the community needs, what the CEO wants, um, and and what's most cost effective and provides a great service because mm-hmm. with public safety you really don't want to just take the the cheaper is better approach. Yeah. So it sounds like what the state could really do in that case is, you know, uh, take barriers out of the way for towns doing that, but not necessarily push them into doing it if they're not, if it doesn't fit them. Totally agree. The less barriers, the better. Absolutely. More gets done. (laughs) (laughs) Brian, is there anything else our advocacy team wants us to focus on this year at the Capitol? I was going to say, I think one of the key things is energy costs. You know, we've Mm -hmm. seen everything spike uh, actually right at the New Year. Um, not only for our community uh, or, or local towns, but also at the residential level mm-hmm. and uh, commercial level. Do you have any thoughts or ideas of, of what the state can do, whether it be uh, virtual net metering, shared solar, any other kind of projects that you think might be effective in trying to combat the, the rising cost of electricity? Yeah, I think they're doing it, but I think it's, again, something that moves slow. They keep canceling or changing it. We're working, we've been working on a project for like six years. It, it's coming to the end now, but again, that's going to help a little bit. Uh, I think there's a lot more they can do, and I think a lot quicker. So you know this is near and dear to my heart, <laughs> having been ranking on energy <laughs> technology for several years, but uh, I'm going to echo what the governor said during Ooh, the election okay. season, and he said... Why aren't we having more nuclear? Mm-hmm. And we almost, Millstone or Dominion, whatever mm-hmm. you want to remember it as, was almost closed. And thank mm-hmm. God it isn't because that's over half of our energy. It provides half of our electricity. Wow. So I think the balance um, between sources is important. Unfortunately, it's not always in our control because there are national policies mm-hmm. that have been set that have diminished gas and obviously fossil fuel, but it's a balancing act. And we have to be able to make sure it's affordable so the economy and people can survive. Um, And we have to take advantage of our class one renewables, which is a little hard with hydrogen and fuel cells when you don't have the gas influx. So if nuclear is the way to go Mm and support it initially and then get get us so our portfolio is balanced. Great. I just have one uh, final question that what, outside of what we have here at CCM's legislative agenda, what would you like to see the legislature do this year that would have a positive impact on the either the state as a whole or your municipality? Well, personally, I think we, we're hoping to get into and talk to some of the leaders about some of the mandates. Some mandates they could change, I think, simply. Um, we, we, we could get in the room and talk about them and then try to explain why, you know, why they're there. But it's the mandates. I mm-hmm. think some of those right away would, would help immediately towns and cities in their budgets. Definitely. I agree with Tom on mandates, especially and those barriers that we talked about, mm-hmm. reducing the barriers. Um, I also feel that less is more. This is the beginning of the long session. The budget is set. If we set have priorities and not as many mm-hmm. bills going forward, and actually it would be amazing if the budget could be passed within the first month of after of the bills are JF'd. Yeah. Because then the communities know what they're up against and what budget restrictions they're going to have. Mm-hmm. And they can actually plan. And that would be a refreshing change for us to have that mm-hmm. budget in April Definitely. or even May. So that's one of the things that I would encourage the General yeah. Assembly to do this year. Yeah, I know unfunded mandates is always a big issue for us at CCM. I know we try to keep track. And I think last time I saw a number, it was somewhere around 1,400. Of them. That's, I was just going <laughs> to yeah. reiterate that. Yeah, yeah 1,400 yeah. mandates. And, and obviously, you know, a lot of them, people are saying, well, they don't cost a lot. But you yeah. add them up, and it's a cumulative effect. Yeah. And, a and little bit times 1,400 adds up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, Mayor Tom Dunham Wolcott, Mayor Laura Hoydeck of Stratford, our vice president and president <laughs> this year. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today at the Capitol and talking on these issues. Uh, thank you. Everyone at home, stick That's around. Great. We'll be back in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, we are back with Municipal Voice, live from the Connecticut State Capitol. Uh, we are here now with Sean Scanlon, the newly elected state comptroller. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. Happy opening day. Great. Yeah, good, good to have everyone in the building again. Yeah. It's an exciting day. Um, so we asked you to come on specifically right now to talk about the Connecticut Health Partnership, something we're kind of interested in. Sure. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, the partnership plan is uh, essentially a way for municipalities to have some savings by leveraging the state employee health plan mm -hmm. and essentially buying health insurance through the state's power. Right now, we have about 200,000. My office, soon to be office, they get sworn in in about two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, they purchase and negotiate health care for 200,000 state employees, retirees, and their mm -hmm. family members. And what the partnership plan basically does is it takes about 50,000 state workers or municipal workers mm -hmm. and essentially allows them to pool with us in a, in a way to get some savings that the state employees are seeing on their plan. Mm -hmm. um, there's about uh, uh, 60,000 employees in it, 120,000 or 120 groups rather. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think so far uh, in the first eight years that it's been there, um, you know, I think it's a good chance for municipalities to see what the benefits are of a plan like that. Great. Brian, do you hear from our members that this is something they would be interested in? Yeah, we have plenty of members that are uh, participating in the health partnership. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that they're concerned about sometimes is just the costs yeah. of, of participating. What, what initiatives are you looking at this year maybe to address that? Well, one of the things that we can do this year and we plan to do is to offer a lower cost option for people. It's mm -hmm. sort of known as a preferred network plan. Essentially, if you sign up for this plan, um, you can only go to the doctors that you know you sign up to see. Uh, it saves a lot of money. The state employee plan has one of these uh, other hospital systems in Connecticut on the private market do mm -hmm. this kind of thing. So if you live by Yale, for example, yep. uh, you agree that you're only going to go to Yale doctors, which every single doctor around where I live, by the way, is Yale affiliated mm -hmm. or you, you name the hospital. Um, if you stay within that preferred provider group, mm -hmm. you can pay a less a premium every month than you would if you had the broad ability to go wherever it is that you wanted. Um, so we want to offer that plan to municipalities coming on this mm -hmm. year for the next year. And it's a conversation between municipal government with, with the unions, uh, with the employees to figure out, hey, does this plan work for us? It's simply an option. Yeah. If they want to go with the current plan, they can do that. But at least now there'll be two options for them to choose from. Mm -hmm. And Brian, do you hear any potential problems with this? Anything you're concerned about? Yeah, I, you know, on its face, it, it sounds like something that our communities would tap into. Yeah. I, I think it's something that provides some flexibility, um, a narrower network, but a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And as um, Comptroller Scanlon just mentioned, you know, your network is pretty full, you know, yeah. um, within the state. So uh, it's, a, it's an option that I think people would be comfortable with. Great. Um, so as you mentioned a little while ago, you're actually getting sworn in yeah. in about two hours yeah. to make it all official. Um, is there anything you're really excited about getting to work on this legislative session? Well, you know, I spent eight years here in this building, mostly mm -hmm. working on health care and then became the chair of the finance committee and, mm -hmm. and started to work on the budget and tax policy. And those two issues are really what the comptroller specializes in, mm -hmm. right? You're the chief financial officer of the state. Uh, you're the chief fiscal watchdog. So look forward to diving into our budget and you know getting getting information out about what's going on, making recommendations to the legislature about how we can be better. Uh, obviously, I think the governor has done a tremendous job during mm -hmm. his first term of getting Connecticut on a better track uh, yeah. when it comes to our finances. And I think the future is very bright for Connecticut. I want to be involved in that. But obviously, um, health care is my passion. It's why I ran to be a state rep in the first place. Um, really proud of the work that we did here and really looking forward to working with groups like CCM to make sure that we are expanding the partnership plan in a way that actually delivers the promise of that plan, which is mm -hmm. to give savings to municipalities so that cops and firefighters and teachers and a whole host of other people who work for the municipalities of Connecticut can actually see a cheaper cost on their plan uh, than they'd be getting on the private market. Um, we got some work to do to make that happen, but I'm confident that the structure is the right one. And with a couple of tweaks, I think we can make it even better for the municipalities of Connecticut. Great. Well, obviously, it's a big day here at the Capitol. You're a busy guy. Uh, congratulations again on being Comptroller, and uh, thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you, and it. obviously, uh, thank you for what you do for Connecticut, and look forward to working with CCM going forward. Great. Uh, you've been listening to the Municipal Voice coming to you live from the State Capitol.
All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. We've been coming to you live from the Capitol. We'd like to thank all of our guests for coming on today. We had Representative Jeff Curry, the House Education Chair. We had Lisa Hammersley of the Connecticut School Finance Project. We had Mayor Tom Dunn of Wolcott and Mayor Laura Hiddick of Stratford and both of our board. We'd like to thank them. And, of course, uh, Comptroller Sean Scanlon. We'd like to thank him for coming on. And tune in next time to the Municipal Voice here on WNHH 103.5 FM. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry draws on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page. America was founded on the principle of representative government, but communities of color are marginalized in this process. If you're interested in running for office or serving on a local board or commission, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities and the Campaign School at Yale are hosting Representation Matters, a free remote two-day training session with informative workshops and panels of experts to give you the tools to make this a reality. Visit ccmcares.com for info on how to register.